You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday the 25th of November 2013. Terralink Group Emirates Centre for Human Rights meet in Parliament. Attorney General apologises for statements about corruption in Britain's Pakistani communities. Up to 600 Afghan interpreters to get council homes after serving with British troops as part of UK asylum deal. Sweden opens first retirement home for gays. Copper theft hitting Italian rail electrical grid hard. France is on the brink of civil war, warns Le Pen. Burma, Buddhists destroy Arakan's last mosque. African state of Angola bans Islam and will destroy all the mosques. 2022 World Cup architect is unhappy about comparisons of stadium to a vagina. Thought for the day, fine feathers, but at what cost? And finally, the UN questionnaire. UK News. Terralink Group, Emirates Centre for Human Rights, meet in Parliament. A group with undeclared links to the Islamic Muslim Brotherhood and the terror group Hamas have been holding meetings at the Houses of Parliament. The Commons event, held in March and September, involving the group with links to Hamas, were organised by the Emirates Centre for Human Rights, ECHR, which says it is a moderate campaign against rights abuses in the Gulf. The ECHR is fronted by a young white British man, Rory Donaghy. It makes no mention on its website or in any other publicity of its close links with the Islamic Cordoba Foundation, described by the Prime Minister David Cameron as a political front for the Muslim Brotherhood. However, the Telegraph has established that the ECHR's website is registered to Malath Shakir, a former director of the Cordoba Foundation. Mrs Shakir is the wife of Anas Altikriti, the current Cordoba Foundation chief, executive and key political lobbyist for the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain. World at eight. Lovely. All terrorists together in our parliament. You couldn't write it, could you? Attorney General apologises for statements about corruption in Britain's Pakistani communities. Attorney General Dominic Grieve has said politicians need to wake up to the issue of corruption in some minority communities. Mr Grieve told the Daily Telegraph it was not restricted to any one community, but he was referring mainly to the Pakistani community. He said it must be made absolutely clear that a favour culture is unacceptable in Britain. British Asian politicians, including a fellow Tory, criticised the comments. Mr Grieve told the Telegraph he would be wary of saying it was just a Pakistani problem, pointing out corruption was found in the white Anglo-Saxon community too. However, Mr Grieve has now apologised for the remarks, which were branded offensive by a senior Tory MEP. World date. Offensive and quite right. If you want pure corruption, go to a Muslim or an African or both. They all live in a corrupt culture, and a culture which exists for the making of money and breeding. Mr Grieve spoke the truth, but of course no one likes the truth any more. It is a nationalist prerogative only. Up to 600 Afghan interpreters to get council house homes after serving with British troops as part of a UK asylum deal. Up to 600 Afghans who have risked their lives to act as interpreters for British troops and officials are to be handed council homes when they move to Britain. The government has made a nationwide appeal to local authorities in a bid to find council homes for the men and their families as part of a £40 million deal. Interpreters who have regularly served on the front line will get visas for themselves and their immediate dependents to come to Britain for a period of five years, along with free travel. In Peterborough, Cambridgeshire, City Council leader Marco Ceres said, I think this is absolutely something the city should do. These people have been in the front line taking bullets with our troops, and if we don't help them, they and their families could be killed. The visas will be offered to around half of the 1,200 interpreters who are currently employed by the armed forces and the Foreign Office. World at eight. Oh boy, another cause. These guys will just change sides when we go, as they always have in that part of the world. Leave them there with their families. No doubt their loyalty cost us money, so they can use that to go elsewhere in the East. Are we so overwhelmed with spare council housing? I really don't think so. European news. Sweden opens first retirement home for gays.
Sweden's first retirement home for elderly members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender communities opened in Stockholm on Friday, capping a four-year effort that may spark a new trend. World at eight. Yup, paving the way for the only inhabitants left in Europe to be Muslims, Chinese and white gays or whatever's. Good forward planning. Copper theft hitting Italian rail, electrical grid hard. Italy's train service, as well as its electrical grid, are suffering severe economic effects of copper thieves. According to government data released Friday, there were 11,000 separate instances of copper theft in Italy, up to 12% since the same period in 2012. Some 2,000 of those thefts were on Italian rail lines, while 5,000 were on property belonging to utility provider Enel, up to 80% since 2011. World at eight. We all know where these thieves come from, don't we? The same bastards who take all the copper off our churches and get away with it on their human rights. Cut off their hands. France is on the brink of civil war, warns Le Pen. France is on the brink of full-scale insurrection and bankruptcy after decades of selling out to immigrants and opening its borders to foreign trade, the leader of the French National Front has told the Times, warning that the country would be put to the fire and the sword. Marine Le Pen, 45, said it would only take a spark to tip Europe's second economic power into virtual civil war and that the trigger could be the violent anti-tax demonstrations taking place in Brittany over the past month. The National Front is now polling as the most popular political group in France. World date. Are we surprised? Non. World news. Burma. Buddhists destroy Arakan's last mosque. A group of Buddhist mobs have attacked the last standing mosque in Arakan's Kayuk Fayu city, damaging the worshipping house severely and destroying its minaret. Last Friday, about 5,000 Buddhists staged a demonstration against OIC visit in Arakan's capital, Sitwe. OIC delegation to Burma included members from Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Djibouti and Bangladesh. During the visit, Aysan Onglu received guarantees from the government to resolve the dilemma of citizenship of more than 800,000 Rohingya Muslims. In October 2012, OIC tried to open an office in Burma to help Muslims there, but the move was blocked by President Thein Sein following a massive protest by Buddhist monks. World at eight. Good for the Buddhists. Muslims have had it easy for too, far too long due to silly and vacuous governments and people of whom we have a plethora over in Europe, all bleating about human rights and sodding mosques. African state of Angola bans Islam and will destroy all mosques. By popular demand, Angolan authorities have taken preemptive action and decided to ban the Muslim religion, which they consider a cult, not a religion. They see what Muslims are doing to Christians, especially in Africa, and are taking steps to prevent the same from happening in Angola. In early October 2013, the Muslims living in Loanda in the municipality of Viana Zango were shocked to see the minaret of their mosque dismantled into pieces on the ground without permission. On Thursday, 3rd of October in the morning, the Angolan authorities decided to destroy the mosque Zango located in the urban district of Viana. The government of Luanda Bento announced in a radio spot that radical Muslims are not welcome in Angola and the Angolan government is not ready for the legalisation of mosques in Angola. And on Tuesday, November 19th, the Minister of Culture, Rosa Cruz da Silva, said, Regarding Islam, the legalisation process has not been approved by the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. Therefore, all mosques will be closed until further notice. It should be noted that the Angolan government has made closing all mosques a priority. The only two mosques located in Loanda have already received a warning document signed by the mayor of the municipality of Viana Jose Moreno. World at eight. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. 2022 World Cup architect is unhappy about comparisons of stadium to a vagina. The female architect behind designs for the new al Wakra sports stadium has said critics who compared her plans to female genitalia are really embarrassing. Zaha Hadid has hit back against claims her designs for the stadium, which will host the 2022 FIFA World Cup, resemble a woman's private parts, insisting they were inspired by an ancient Tao boat. Iraqi-born Hadid, who is considered one of the world's best female architects, also suggested the plans would not have faced the same criticism if they were designed by a man. World at eight. Of course they wouldn't. They're men. But what if the Dow boats were designed to resemble female private parts? 
Better than a family jewels look, I suppose. Thought for the day. Now this saying is an old one, but a very true one, and applies even more so to nowadays than ever. Why nowadays? Well, because haute couture is no longer the premise of the rich, and all girls and women deserve it. And in fashion, they get it. Now, in my lifetime, I've had many financial ups and downs, and remember my up times, no one, but no one shopped for clothes at M&S, BHS or whatever, and Primark had not yet showed its face. Real haute couture was the realm of mothers, and we youngsters shopped at Richards and other fairly still-made-in-England clothes emporiums. I went to school with one of the buyers for M&S lingerie, and she said that many of her mother's friends didn't shop there because the trimmings were brought in from Switzerland and not made in England. Well, they'd be turning in their grades now, wouldn't they? True haute couture is the realm of the footballers' wives, Arabs and pop stars or celebs, and to be honest, most of the clothes from M&S are marginally better than Primark and probably made in the same places, for example Bangladesh, Taiwan, Thailand and China. The standards of the once very excellent M&S socks are now terrible, with the main seam splitting almost immediately, and we will get more socks from our local market. They can't be worse and will certainly be much cheaper. But it is the rush for fashion and the pressure of people with money, but not necessarily any taste, which is fueling some of the nastiest fashions yet. We frown at the Victorians, whose lust for ostrich feathers almost drove the poor ostrich off the face of the earth. Likewise, beaver fur and more furry animals met their demise on the altar of fashion. But we are doing the same, and in ever-increasing numbers. The plebs have discovered Kashmir and Angora previously out of reach of the sheeples who couldn't afford it. I'm out of this one because I can't wear anything along woolly lines and this covers both those categories. I itch with a passion. Or rather, these previously out of range wools have been brought down to the level of the sheeples and Primark. What by? A plethora of goats or rabbits who willingly shed their coats for the sake of the sheeples and their money. No, but the Chinese and their usual ability to reduce all animal products to a bare minimum with a maximum of pain and torture for the animals and speed for the so-called harvesters. In Devon, there's a keeper of cashmere goats, and what he has to say is wonderful and cautionary. Unlike our foreign friends, he doesn't do it primarily for export or money, but for the love of the herd themselves. And I quote, Then there are the challenges of keeping these goats on a day-to-day -day basis. They are not dairy animals, so if you've ever kept goats before, then... Forget virtually everything you know. They are proud, independent, flock-based animals which are happiest kept in large numbers where the conditions are just right for their needs. They do not appreciate being kept inside for most of their lives, nor being kept in just tiny groups. A few will make the transition to being pets, but very few. They still retain an air of aloofness and are always wary of strangers. Now, not being a vegetarian or anything like that, I have no personal problem with raising animals for food or clothes. I believe that animal husbandry and the care of these animals whilst they are alive is important to me, as is the slaughter. Since the immigration into this country of strangers who do not respect our views, animals have become increasingly endangered and I resent this, just as I resent the torture of animals abroad by cruel idiots hell-bent on making goods for our idiots to buy. The lucky Devonian goats are a far cry from the poor tortured Angora rabbits, kept as usual in filthy conditions in China, and who have their fur pulled out in clumps while still alive. They are then put back in their dirty cages to grow a little more, and then this barbaric form of animal torture starts yet again. Of course, these poor little beings only live up to two years, and frankly, if I was plucked of my hair, which left raw patches of skin or sheared badly and quickly with blunt scissors, and put back in my cage to suffer, I wouldn't want to live at all, let alone another year or so. I know we animal lovers are accused of putting animals on a level with humans, but suffering and torture are just that, across the great divide. Pain is pain. And I would challenge anyone to say that any mammal doesn't feel pain like us, fellow mammals. Insects, reptiles, fishes and birds all feel pain as well. If you have a brain, however small, you feel pain. So think before you buy an Angora jumper from M&S and think about the poor bleeding and suffering rabbits whilst doing so. You might be put off. Of course, if you're happy with that, you might also buy an anorak with cat or dog hair trims, snakeskin bags and boots, all made by the poor snake donating his skin whilst alive for many hours afterwards, and goose-down filled duvets or pillows also obtained the same way as the angora rabbits. 
Go home to ivory-filled cabinets and tiger-skin rugs and stuffed real cats made in China. I frankly don't expect the gormless young sheep or girls feeling anything much when they buy up Primark or M&S because conscience does come down to brain power, doesn't it? And I fear that along with money is probably lacking, especially now, we have Christmas coming, which increasingly lacks anything to do with the actual event of Christ's birth, which has effectively been put off until February. So I'm sitting here in the first Primark jumper I've ever bought and will not buy again. It itches. It was made in God knows where and is apparently 100% acrylic and is large and shapeless. I know in the first wash it'll fall apart, but I thought that at a price of 10 quid I'd try it never again. But places like Primark and markets all stock clothes made in foreign climes. Most are with slave labour, which incidentally means that if we all got on our high horses about slavery, these poor people would not have jobs at all and would starve. The buildings that collapse are not built by Primark and other so-called fashion houses. They're built by locals to their usual third world standards and duly collapse. I am an animal lover of all animals and things that crawl, walk, fly or slither or hop. I don't hate any animal, although I'd rather not be at the business end of a shark, bear or tiger. I'm not a mad cat lady because I would love a doggy as well, but our three brother pussies are superb little beings and the thought of beating them to death to soften them up for Chinese soup is revolting in the extreme. I've always admired the Chinese for their hard work and some parts of their culture, but they do have the ability to be even crueler to animals than most of their Mongolian counterparts. The one reason I dread the Chinese getting a hold in Europe in general is that our animal rights would go out of the window. Tiger farms, bear bile shops, live monkey brains for treats. Every part of every endangered animal on the planet would be up for grabs by the wealthy. Cat and dog sweet and sour soup and bloody noodles everywhere. And lots of people who for the most part do resemble aliens from outer space with their round faces and slitty eyes. Not the picture put forward by corporate globalisation of a beneficial civilization, all speaking pure Mandarin and benefiting the Western world. But to a civilization to whom human life is so cheap, animal life is cheaper still. And the Chinese have survived famines that would have killed off most Europeans, but their animal rights still stink more than the slums of Shanghai. But even in the face of this, when are we going to stop spending or getting into debt to the East for clothes that we don't need and shouldn't buy? Apparently, thanks to our governments, we are still in debt to China for containers full of absolute crap that remain unopened on the docks. Apart from the animal cruelty angle, many of the clothes, ornaments, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Halloween and Christmas crap that is produced without any attention to controls whatsoever. Bad dyes, cheaper than cheap contents and shoddy workmanship all contribute to a maelstrom of problems and we still have to pay for them. What would happen if we simply stopped making the demand for cheap clothing? This idea of something for virtually nothing has only reared its head in the last 30 years, when what is known as a standard has not only come crashing down, but been delivered to everyone as a right to buy. Old standards have been spread very thinly on the ground. Liz Jones wrote a bit in the Daily Mail this weekend on us going soft, and she is right. Even poor souls who a couple of generations ago didn't have a bog in the back garden think they're entitled to spend hundreds of pounds on mainly crap on their kids for Christmas. Get real, mates. Even the very rich in the good old days didn't spend the equivalent to what you spend now. That is why they and England thrived. Because of what they made and sold, not what they bought in and spent money on. There is a huge class war over money even now as I talk. People criticise people who spend huge amounts of money on school fees and or universities, whilst losing sight of the fact that the criticisers spend more money on alcohol, cheap clothes, cheaper holidays, food and takeaways and fancy cars than is spent by the so-called rich. A known fact is, if you bought a good joint of meat every two days for a family of four and cooked it at home, you would spend less money and have less rubbish them than when you buy fast food, cheaper food, snacks, sweets, booze, fags and takeaways, but would never consider it as being so. It is all down to standards and progress, both in the animal world and ours, and we mustn't lose sight of past standards, as we've lost sight of almost everything else from our past.
It isn't good to live in the past, but unless you respect your history, you will not respect your future. And instead of buying Chinese and Indian crap, send a few pounds to the animal charities who are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. When my husband was working, I used to send donations to the World Wildlife Fund, the RSPB, the Cat Shelter, the Mare and Foal Sanctuary, the Alternative Sanctuary, Animal Aid, International Animal Rescue, World Horse Welfare, APA, which is the Animal Protection Agency, WDCS, Four Paws, WSPA, and Spanner, who helped donkeys and horses in the Middle East, HSI Global, Network for Animals, RSPCA, and Blue Cross, who do wonders for pets if their owners are broke. All these animal charities do wonderful work, and of course there are many animal charities local to where you might live who would be very grateful of a small donation, say the amount you would spend on a bit of Primark tat, a fiver. Christmas is a time for giving, so let's not forget the cow, sheep and goat in the stable at Bethlehem. That is part of being a Christian at Christmas. And finally, the oldies are the best. Last month, the worldwide telephone survey was conducted by the UN. The only question asked was, could you please give your honest opinion about solutions to the food shortage in the rest of the world? The survey was a massive failure because of the following. In Eastern Europe, they didn't know what honest meant. In Western Europe, they didn't know what shortage meant. In Africa, they didn't know what food meant. In China, they didn't know what opinion meant. In the Middle East, they didn't know what solution meant. In South America, they didn't know what please meant. In the USA, they didn't know what the rest of the world meant. In the UK, they hung up as soon as they heard the Indian accent. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>